Bienvenue à tous. So welcome to, to everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to welcome John Levin from uh, Stanford University. Uh, so John is actually visiting uh, Nuffield and All Souls College uh, this year in Oxford, uh, and visiting PSC uh, this week. Uh, he's a, a leading scholar on uh, many different topics, actually. So uh, one. Uh, area of speciality is uh, internet data, the economics of uh, internet data, and the, the economics of uh, big data. Uh, he has also worked uh, a lot on uh, auctions and uh, market design, publishing a few uh, remarkable papers in that. He has also worked uh, in some other fields, in a way, healthcare and uh, insurance, uh, where he also produced a, a few papers. So it's a great honor to, to have him here. Uh, John was the recipient of the very prestigious uh, John Bates Clark Medal in 2011 uh, in, in the US. And uh, he's a, a fellow of uh, the American uh, Foundation of Arts and Science, no, Academy, sorry, uh, of Arts and Science, and he's a fellow of the Economic Society, which is also uh, something one of the most pre prestigious uh, sign in, uh, in our profession. And uh, he's, he's also spent some time at uh, Yahoo, uh, micro research group, so showing that he has also interest in uh, applying uh, his uh, theoretical and, uh, ideas to the real world, as we call this world from the academic point of view. Uh, and uh, so tonight he's going to uh, give us a, a lecture uh, title you see, learning about consumers and market from uh, internet data, and we are extremely pleased to, to welcome you. So the, the talk will be about an hour long. Uh, you can ask you know, clarifying questions during the talk if there are things that are not so clear, which I doubt. Uh, and then we can have more, uh, you know, a, a debate for 15, <laughs> half an hour, uh, a debate afterwards, uh, after uh, John's presentation. So the floor is yours, and thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Jean-Marc. Um, it's really nice to, to be here and to get to, to visit uh, uh, Paris School of Economics. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk today about um, learning about consumers and markets from, from, uh, from internet data. So one of the really exciting things that's uh, happened uh, in economics, I think, over the last decade or so has been the explosion of, of new data uh, that's available to economists for uh, economic research. And, I like this quote that from Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of, of Google, it's from a few years ago, and he said, uh, you know, between the birth of the world in 2003, there were five exabytes of information created, and we now create five exabytes uh, every two days. So I'm, I'm actually pretty sure that both those numbers are, in some sense, wrong scientifically, uh, but the quote is sort of just right in spirit, that you know, there's been this, this sort of uh, uh, amazing uh, change in the amount of, of data that's uh, collected and is available. And of course, in economics, some of that data was data, like government, government administrative data, has always been around. It's just now we can access it more easily in electronic form. But other types of, 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 of data, like data on the details of individual behavior, the way people search for information, the way uh, people uh, make decisions about purchasing, the way they communicate with their friends, the way they search for jobs, is now available in, in, in sort of much more richness and detail and granularity than, uh, than we've ever uh, had before. And uh, you know, I think that's, in a sense, sort of creating a lot of uh, uh, neat opportunities for, for research. Um, and in some sense, for, for a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, uh, reasons. You know, one is because having extremely detailed data about individual choices or about the way firms make decisions, about strategies firms are following, uh, about the way people communicate, allows us to test theories that have been developed over 10 or 20 or 50 years about um, the way people interact and about individual decision making, about the way markets work. We can post hypotheses and we have much more detailed data to, to try to look for the answers to try to find research designs in, in detailed micro data. And then secondly, just because a lot of the types of data that's become available is just about things that we didn't see before, that it's about the, the details of the way markets work, about the details of the, of, of the way people interact. And 
it's, it's often, you know, a lot of the, the new data that's available is often private sector data. It's data from companies. It's data that we didn't really see before. And so you know, part of what is exciting, I think, is you just get an opportunity to just discover a lot of interesting facts uh, and then see how those line up with our, with our theories that we've been developing in economics. And of course, sometimes they line up really well and sometimes they don't line up so well. And that's an opportunity for, for new theorizing. So I thought what I would try to do today is talk about uh, some research that I've worked on over the last couple of years. This is a, a, based on a, a collaboration with researchers at, at eBay, the, the big online uh, marketplace. And uh, this is a, a collaboration we started um, really with kind of two motivations. So one motivation uh, was, was to learn about internet commerce, to learn about online markets, to, to see what we could learn about, about competition, about uh, market design, about uh, pricing, about individual purchasing decisions, search behavior, and so forth, using uh, their data. And then the second was to, was sort of based on the, what I just said about new data, was just to try to think about what would be interesting empirical strategies to try to take advantage of all of this new data that was coming available. And we, you know, we sort of had the feeling that you know, we were just going to look at sort of one aspect of, of behavior, internet commerce, but that similar types of research would be possible looking at internet search data or labor markets or you know, other types of uh, 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 settings, and that we might be able to learn something about how to make use of that type of, of data in interesting ways for economics. And, uh, and, and what you'll see is that part of that is going to be trying to come up with basically empirical strategies that sort of line up well with economic theory and that are scalable, that work well with large amounts of data. And just to give you a sense, you know, so eBay is just, of course, one internet platform, but, and they operate in 20 or 30 countries. But just in the US, they have about a, th about, uh, a billion product listings every year. They've got about uh, uh, several hundred million transactions. And, and then they have trillions of, you know, they record trillions of events of people clicking around, searching for different products and, and making decisions. And so there's, you know, there's an opportunity to, to see a lot of detail about what people are doing. Um, but you know, you've got to do something that's going to going to work with with a trillion observations, basically, as opposed to you know, opening it up in an Excel spreadsheet and looking through it and seeing what you what you make of it. Okay, so what, what, well, the way I was going to organize today's talk was was to was to to basically just go through a series of of examples. Um, I'm going to do three examples, and uh, just to illustrate some ideas about internet marketplaces and uh, some approaches that we. I've worked on to using this type of data. And, uh, and I'll try to do the example so they illustrate sort of both the points that I had before, sort of both the, the idea that you could use this sort of new type of data to uh, think about constructing research designs to answer sort of clear, well-established economic policy questions. And some uh, of the examples will just be about, um, particularly the last one will just be about sort of stumbling around and looking for interesting facts and then seeing how they line up with our with our theories. So I'll, I'll try to give a little bit of illustration of, of both. Okay. Okay, so the one I'm going to start with is, is a question about public policy. And, uh, and it's a question that's been uh, uh, debated in the last uh, uh, five or so years in, in the U.S. and it has to do with uh, tax policy. It has to do with the way that sales taxes are collected on the internet. So the U.S. has a sort of funny system of sales taxes for, you know, by comparison with, with Europe, because in the United States, sales taxes are state level taxes. And uh, every state, state gets to set their own sales tax. But because of, a, basically because of a historical accident in some sense, because of a Supreme Court decision back in the early 1990s, taxes are not, states are not allowed to collect taxes when a buyer from the state buys something from out of state. So I live in California, if I buy something from a seller in California, the state of California can compel the seller to collect sales tax, which in California might be 9 or 10 percent. But if I buy something from a seller in Nevada or New York or Illinois or some other state, the state of California can't compel the seller to collect sales tax. And so as a result, interstate transactions, which used to be just a small deal because people would do mail order, but it wasn't a very big part of retail, uh, but now has become a big deal because people shop so much on the internet, they, the taxes often aren't collected. <coughs> okay, and so um, 
there's been a lot of question about should the federal government step in and kind of rationalize the, the sales tax policy. And part of that debate has, has hinged on the question of, well, what would happen? Would that cause people to stop buying online? Would it cause people to buy in different ways? Do, do these taxes even matter anyway? I mean, maybe no one even pays attention to what sales taxes are. It doesn't seem necessarily like the most obvious thing to drive your, your decisions. And there's some evidence that it, you know, it does matter. So for example, uh, Amazon, the, you know, the big retailer, so uh, they've been very active in, in lobbying. And um, this, is a, this, this picture on the right is, is, a, is a map uh, of the state of California here. And, and this shows you uh, the, the, uh, a picture of, uh, of, of where Amazon, when they built their distribution system, uh, located their warehouses to ship to California. So California has 38 million people, so it's the biggest state, of course. And the people live on the coast. But Amazon didn't build their warehouses on the coast. They built their warehouses on the California Nevada desert. And they built the warehouses on the California Nevada border, on the Nevada side of the California Nevada border. And you would think, you know, why would you build your warehouses four hours from where the people are, your customers are? But the reason is because if you put your warehouses here and you ship them the extra four hours, people don't have to pay the 9 or 10% tax to, to uh, uh, Rams doesn't have to collect the 9 or 10% uh, tax. Okay, so, um, uh, okay. Warehouses are on the cheaper in Nevada? What if? Warehouses are on the cheaper in Nevada? Yeah. Real estate is also cheaper in Nevada, but you probably, it, it's also pretty cheap in, in, in here too. So there's, uh, I mean, it's not cheap if you're in Los Angeles, or, but there would be cheaper, closer places. Yeah. Well, you, here they're on this side of the mountain, you have to go over the mountains, but then you could be in the Central Valley, I suppose. <laughs> But I'm sure they did get pretty cheap real estate also for their warehouses. Okay, so, so, we, so anyway, so there have been some studies trying to figure out, well, what, you know, what would be the effect of having internet sales tax collections? This has been a problem that people have thought about for a while. But of course, with traditional data, you have to think about this mostly with aggregate data. So you look at, for example, a state raises its tax on cigarettes. You look to see whether people in that state buy less cigarettes or whether they go across state borders to buy cigarettes. And there was a, actually one famous study on internet tax policy by Austin Goolsbee, who later became Obama's chief uh, economic advisor. I doubt it was because of his internet sales tax paper, but uh, perhaps it was. Um, and uh, he, uh, he wrote a paper looking at survey data where it was a survey of about 1,000, 2,000 people. They'd asked individuals, if you're living on, people who lived in high tax states and low tax states, do they buy stuff online? The idea being that if you buy online from a high tax state, that might be evidence that you were trying to avoid the sales tax. And he actually found huge effects, really huge effects that have kind of driven a lot of the debate because he, he, he argued that about a quarter of internet commerce was due to tax avoidance. Now, of course, this study was back in 1997 when you know, the internet was kind of new. And actually when he did his study, I think, you know, something like 15% of the people in his survey or in his, this data he looked at had ever bought anything online. So that gives you sort of a sense of, you know, the world's a little different then. So we thought this might be an interesting thing to look at using sort of more detailed uh, data. So we, w what we thought was, well, maybe we could come up with a research design or some kind of empirical strategy that would tell us about, yeah. Just a question, given that it's a two-sided market, the, the uh, the equilibrium will also be determined by the location of the suppliers. If, if the guy becomes big enough, also suppliers will go to Nevada, maybe. Well, Amazon did. So it no, but I'm, I'm talking, Amazon is in the middle. So to optimize his location, he has to take care of the cost of the suppliers of the goods that he is distributing. So if Amazon becomes big enough, maybe he will track suppliers to Nevada. It's a, it's a general equilibrium thing. Ah. Because he's two-sided. Understood, understood. You, so, okay, not so, the distance also, only to the consumer, but also to the suppliers. So I agree. So I don't know empirically whether, in fact, they attracted suppliers into nearby yeah, states yeah. near the distribution. But I agree that the, you know, the, the, general point, the general point is that, of course, once you have these sort of odd taxes, it's going to distort all the geographic decisions in some sense. And there's, you know, that's one example of it. But there could easily be other location decisions. I take your points well taken. But I don't know if it actually happened. I don't know how much the, it, it will also affect the, the, the location of Amazon. That's Yes, and so I don't guess. I guess I'm not sure whether 
it, you know, this has gone on long enough to sort of reach an equilibrium that was responsive to this. Um, but it's possible that it, that it might. Okay, so let me show you sort of the way we, we proposed to, to study this. So, so we wanted to try to understand whether people were actually, how responsive they are to sales taxes. So we, 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 have, the, we have the following idea. We're going to take people who are searching around on, on the internet, on eBay, who are looking for, uh, for items. So just to give you a feeling for it, so imagine that someone searches for hat on eBay. So something like this list of nice hats comes up uh, on the page. And what you can see is you, you, you see the hats, you see the prices of the hats, but you don't see whether there's taxes and you don't see where the seller is located. Now, if someone clicks on a hat, like for example this hat, at that point the buyer gets more or the shopper gets more information and one of the things they find out is where the seller is located. Okay, so this seller happens to be located in, in New York State. Okay, so what that means is if the buyer is located in New York State, they're going to have to pay just under 9% in sales tax. If the buyer is located, say, in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or another state, maybe even the same distance from this seller, but uh, across the state border, they won't have to pay sales tax. And so in a sense, we now have sort of just, you know, by looking through the data, we've been able to find sort of a research design where we might be able to take people who in principle should be similar in their tastes. After all, they clicked on the same hat, uh, but one of them has been exposed to a tax surprise, a negative, you know, an extra 9%, 8.5% uh, bump in the price, and the, and the others happen. And we could then estimate tax sensitivity by comparing the people who got the negative tax surprise with the people who, who didn't. Okay. And of course, this is just one item, but we could do that at scale by going and finding you know, thousands or tens of thousands or a few hundred thousand items then searching through and finding you know, several million buyers who have clicked on those items and then uh, comparing the, the ones who faced the tax and ones who didn't. And we can use a very simple empirical strategy because this is such a simple research design. We can just run something like a logistic regression where the dependent variables, did you buy the item? And the <laughs> explanatory variable is what was the tax that you faced, which is personalized. It's zero if you were at cross state and one, and whatever your state tax was if you, were, if you were in state. And then we might want to control for things like, well, how far away from you, you know, what was the distance between you and the seller, uh, for example. And then we'd also want to control for the items. So this is a regression run where we uh, have several hundred thousand items and we've got about uh, uh, just under seven, uh, six and a half uh, to seven million uh, shoppers. And we're trying to estimate what's the effect of the taxes. And what we can see then is that, in fact, taxes have, uh, uh, a negative effect on purchasing and a fairly significant negative effect on people's uh, purchasing patterns. So that is, um, people are less likely to buy when they face, significantly less likely to buy when they face tax, which is basically what you'd, of course, what you'd expect if people were paying attention to the full price that they were going to pay. On this subject, why eBay doesn't use a, a price, a fixed price before taxes? Because usually firms are taking into account and discriminate the price is not the tax inclusive price yeah. right so they so they just quote the base price and then um, uh, and then the tax is added on and I um, it's a good question it's sort of you'll see it in a minute I'm going to show you another version of this in a minute actually where they also don't include the shipping fee so they, 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 you basically see the kind of top price, but you don't see the bottom line price. And that just happens to be the way they've organized the platform. But it might not be the right way to organize the platform. It's, it's just the way they, they've set it up. Um, okay. Okay. So, so, th so this is sort of a way to get, this is basically a way to get estimates of tax sensitivity. And actually, this is, this is a regression that you know, I mentioned before that you, in addition to having a well-defined question you could try to answer, you might just sort of stumble on other kinds of interesting things. This is a regression that actually lets us stumble on another sort of interesting fact about the way people make purchasing decisions on the internet, which, and the way to think about this one is, is just to kind of, um, is, to, is to think about the person searching around, and I said that when they searched around, they couldn't tell where the seller was, and then when they clicked on the item, they might find out that they had to pay tax, and they might find out they didn't have to pay tax. The other thing they find out is where the seller is located. Now you might think that that just doesn't matter at all. It's the internet, so why would you care where the seller is located? But actually, 
if you, if you look at what, this, what these numbers say, it says, they say that if you're, a, if you're a buyer and you learn that the seller is located farther away from you, you're actually significantly less likely to want to buy from that seller. How much less likely? Well, if you go from being, say, something like 50 kilometers away to something like 500 kilometers away, you're about 5% less likely to, uh, uh, to buy from a, from a seller. And in fact, if you cross state borders, so if you, if, you, if you were in the seller state and you cross out of the seller state, so for example, if you do that from a state that has no sales taxes like Oregon, so there's not a sales tax effect, or otherwise if you hold the tax effect constant, you're signi- there's, a, there's a border effect as well. You don't like to buy from sellers who are in a, a different state from you. Actually, that's sort of a funny result, but we found that, that quite a puzzling result because we, we, actually there had been a study, there was a study about a decade ago by a professor at Chicago, Ali Hortaksu, and some co-authors, and they had estimated geographic preferences for internet purchasing. This is maybe in 2003 or so. They did it with, with US data and they did it with South American data, and they'd found very strong geographic <coughs> preferences. People like to buy from sellers who are close to them. And they had hypothesized that part of that might be preferences that people had preferences similar to people who live near them. Okay. So now we're looking at this again, but we're looking at people who in principle have the same preferences because they click on the same item because now we have micro data instead of just looking at sort of flows of goods from one region to the next and sort of estimating a gravity type model. And you can see here that even though people have similar preferences, they still don't like to buy from, from people who are far away, you know, which, which suggests that maybe you know, I guess we didn't really have a, another story. Maybe they, they, they trust people who are close to them more or something like that, which is, you know, in, nowadays you might think is actually a little funny. You might think people would have gotten over any trust issues that they had on the, on the internet uh, uh, a decade ago. Okay, so, um, okay, so, I, so, so let me just make, yeah, a oh, question. <coughs> on the previous slide, uh, you indicate that uh, the same state dummy is uh, somewhat uh, tautological with the log plus effective tax. I mean, you have a, a double effect. So yeah. in the log plus, uh, the effective tax, what you are really measuring there is the effect of uh, changing the tax for people who are buying outside their own state. Yeah. So if you really want to look at the impact of, uh, of the tax, you should add some part of the same state dummy effect. Perfect, okay, so, so that's a really good question. Okay, so this, so, in, okay, so, in this, so these are three different specifications. Actually, don't worry about the last one because it has to do with the, the, the shipping policy. So it's, but take a look at these two. So in this regression, the tax effect captures the same state effect okay. and the tax effect. Okay. Here, we split them out. And then you might ask, well, how do we identify the tax effect? Because when you, the, I, the way I described it, I was actually, you know, I, I went, quickly there and I said that the, we, were, we were identifying that off comparing people in the state who had the tax and out of the state who didn't have the tax. Once we say that actually it's just different being in the state, then the way we're identifying this is by, for example, looking at people who live in Oregon who have no tax, so whether they buy in state or out of state because there's no sales tax in Oregon. And we're saying people who, who live in Oregon, when the seller is just outside of Oregon, they're 8% less likely to buy. If you're in California, though, then when you cross the state border, when the seller crosses the state border in Nevada, we have both the same state effect and we now put on the 10% tax. So in a sense, it's, a, it's like a difference in difference uh, empirical strategy in this, in this one. And you can see that it's actually a bigger effect because here it bundles in the positive same state effect with the tax effect. Here, once you break it out, the, actually the taxes are you know, twice as important. Okay, so I'll just mention a couple of other things that this is about the, you know, the, this type of, using this type of, of data to, to do a study like this. So one is that, you know, one nice feature of having really detailed data is that you can, you can, you can do analyses that would be hard with typical aggregate data. So you can, for example, ask, is it, do taxes matter more for some items than for other? And of course they do. They matter more for electronics. They matter more for DVDs. They matter more for computers. They matter less for clothing or uh, uh, more idiosyncratic uh, items. And, uh, and, and, you can, and you can do things like you can ask, well, what happens if someone doesn't buy something after they found out that they had to pay tax? And it turns out that you can follow them around and you can see that what they are more likely to buy is the similar type of item, but just from someone out of state. Okay, and there's, 
So, th so that's sort of a nice benefit of having really detailed data on what people are, are doing. Now there's also some limitations because the, the, one of the issues is, of course, the way I set up this research design is I, I tried to estimate the effect of taxes for an individual buyer looking at an individual item. And that gave this sort of, hopefully, nice, clean research design. But, uh, but it, had the, 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 it has the disadvantage that if you, it, it doesn't quite exactly map to the policy question that you might care about. The policy question you might care about would be something like, what would happen if we imp collected tax on every item? as opposed to just on this one item. So if it's just the one item, you could substitute to another item. If it's every item, now all of a sudden you can't find any item that doesn't have a tax collected on it. So you, know, you would have to have some sense of what the substitution patterns would be in order to compute what the, the overall policy effect would be. So in the, in the paper we ended up publishing, we, we had to do some you know, micro-level data estimates, but then we have to sort of add in some extrapolation to think about the, the policy question. So it doesn't, you know, there's a bit of a trade-off there. Okay, so that was sort of the first example I wanted to give you about uh, trying to answer policy questions using this type of data. The, the, the second... What was ultimately your... Oh, well, ultimately the answer was that... Ultimately the answer was that... Um, so we was, was an estimate of what would happen if, if you collected tax. We, so we had several estimates. So one was an estimate about the way that geographic uh, purchasing patterns would change, which is that they would change to be uh, more local and more in-state. And the other was an estimate of how much, uh, how much the overall, um, uh, what would be the overall impact on e-commerce if you did national sales tax collection. And we estimated that if you, if Congress came in and imposed and mandated that all sales taxes are collected, which would very state by state, but would on average be about seven to eight percent, seven and a half percent. Then it would reduce internet commerce by about twelve and a half percent. It would be a one, but that'd be a one. You know, of course, it's growing very fast, so it would, that would be a one time. It'd be less than a year uh, of of growth, and that was about half of the prior estimate from Goolsbee. And he had estimated twenty five percent, so it was just about half the half the size. Um, uh, okay, so the, the, the second example I, I wanted to, to give you is um, it's not about public policy, but is about uh, pricing and uh, uh, selling strategies. Okay, so one of the ideas that, that you, know, you hear about the internet, and I think is right, is that the, you know, one thing that the internet has done is it's, it's made it much cheaper for firms to uh, to change prices or to uh, experiment with different selling strategies with different information they provide to consumers and then to, you know, to capture all that data and then to, to, to use it to improve their, their policies. Okay, and that, that, that in principle is something that, that, that firms can exploit. It also makes the internet for researchers a really nice laboratory to, to look at the effectiveness of different selling strategies or test hypotheses from behavioral economics and <coughs> so forth. Okay, um, and and of course, there, you know, there's different ways to do that, and none of them are really necessarily all that easy in some sense. So one of the ways that you know, economic researchers have tried to do that is, is by running their own experiments. So for example, I could get the National Science Foundation to buy me a thousand packs of playing cards or whatever it would be, and I could go try to sell them in two or three different ways, and, and that way I could, I could have a nice, clean experiment to uh, 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 to, to test some particular hypothesis about pricing or about uh, uh, the way people make decisions, or how they bid in auctions, for example. Okay, but um, of course that's not a very scalable strategy because even if I could get money to buy a thousand items or even five thousand items, I'm not going to get money from the National Foundation to set up a firm to compete with Walmart. So um, I, I'm going to need something you know, to do something scalable. We're going to have to do with observational data, but of course observational data with the internet is tricky, and it's tricky for just this reason in some sense. It's tricky because just as the internet has you know, facilitated a lot of experimentation, it's also facilitated a huge explosion of different types of product varieties and, and you know, sort of the long tail of internet commerce, so to speak. Okay, and th so this is, a, this is a, just a, a picture that will give you a, a, an illustration of sort of both the, the kind of what you think you might be able to do with internet data and also why it's tricky. So this is, a, this is a, also a, a picture of search results from, from a search on eBay, and it's a search for, uh, for tailor-made driver, so t 
TaylorMade's a kind of golf club manufacturer, and it's a particular kind of golf club. And, uh, and what you can see here is, first of all, they, you know, on this particular day, they were selling a lot of different TaylorMade drivers. There's 2,694 listings for TaylorMade uh, drivers. And, uh, and people are trying to sell those drivers in all kinds of different ways. So people are selling those drivers uh, by, uh, at a posted price. They're selling them by auction. They've, uh, some people have posted a price, but they're willing to accept uh, lesser offers. They're willing to negotiate. Uh, some people have uh, set up an auction, but they've also said there's a price at which you could uh, preempt the auction and, uh, and, uh, and buy uh, in advance of it. Um, there's people who are top-rated sellers, there's people who aren't top-rated sellers, there's people who are offering free shipping, there's people who are offering expedited shipping, there's people who are just trying to do all kinds of different stuff. And so what you might think is, okay, this is going to be a really neat opportunity to test different hypotheses about pricing and uh, the design of sales maxims, for example. You know, I might like to test what's the difference between an auction and a posted price, or what's the effect of free shipping. But it's going to be tricky to do. Because just as people are trying all different ways to price things and sell things, they're also selling all different variations of the same thing. They're selling used golf clubs and left-handed ones, the ones that are a little longer and a little shorter, and you know, many different variations. And you might be worried that the people who are selling things one way are different than the people who are selling it another way. And how could you control for all of those? You know, the people who are selling by posted price might have nicer pictures, for example. And maybe the pictures are actually more important mm -hmm. than the price. So what we need is some way to do sort of controlled experiments or some way to do a, you know, nicer controls. And so let me suggest one, you know, one way that we came up with that we thought about, and, and that's to do, the, to do the following. So this is a, a, a subset of, the, of those last uh, listings that I showed you. There were 2,600 of them, and now I've just picked out 33 of them. And what's special about these 33 listings is that they're all being uh, offered by the same seller. So this is one particular seller who, who uh, uh, named Budget Golfer. And he's, uh, he's offering, uh, they're all the same golf club, they all have the same picture. And he's offering one particular kind of golf club. And, uh, and um, so all these listings are the same, except they're not exactly the same, because what this guy is doing is he is, uh, at the same time, offering to sell this golf club for $124.99, but he's also running auctions where you could bid to buy this golf club. And the auctions are at different stages, so they have different prices right now. Uh, but eventually those prices would go up and they might start end above or below or at $124.99. And so this guy, in a sense, is running what amounts to you know, quite a nice experiment to see what is the difference between an auction and offering something for sale at a, at a posted <coughs> price. And actually he's doing a little bit more than that because he's also, uh, I guess it's a little hard to see in this picture, but he's also uh, running a bit of an experiment with his shipping fees. So he's offering this golf club with two different shipping fees. He's offering to sell it with a $7.99 shipping fee and with a $9.99 shipping fee. And so if you wanted to know whether people pay attention to shipping fees, you could look to see whether the auctions that he runs with the $7.99 shipping fee end at a higher price than the auctions he runs with the $9.99 shipping fee. Actually, he's also offering it at a posted price with two different shipping fees. And so you could also test whether people just buy the lower price thing when they could buy the equivalent thing at two different uh, prices. Okay. Okay, so we, had the, we, we noticed that there were a bunch of people doing this on eBay, and actually it turned out that there weren't just a couple people, that actually that's what most people are, were doing on, on eBay. Uh, if you look at eBay and you look at the listings on eBay, so I said there were a billion listings, if you just picked at random one of those billion listings, about 85% of those listings would have some matched listing where the seller had offered the same exact item, possibly in the same exact way, but possibly in a different way. And so turned out that this kind of behavior where you try out different ways of selling stuff is just completely ubiquitous uh, online. And it's just actually it turns out to be the same in things like internet advertising as well. People who are running internet advertising campaigns often will use the, you know, slightly vary the text they show on Google or they'll vary their bid and they, in a sense, try to experiment with different ways to, to buy advertising. Okay, so, so we, we, um, we decided to, we, we basically constructed a data set by going back over the history of eBay and picking out all of these sort of micro experiments that sellers had been, had been running. Uh, and, uh, and then we tried to use that to see what kinds of questions we could answer about pricing strategies and how people respond to different ways of 
uh, of selling things, where the idea is that you know, for, we, we would start by asking a question like, you know, what was the, uh, what's the effect of, uh, of, uh, of having more pictures on the picture page? And then we would look and see how many sellers had offered exactly the same thing, but sometimes they did four pictures, and sometimes they added two extra pictures. <laughs> and then we'd say, well, maybe you know, they added two extra pictures for a reason. So let's take only the times when they had the four pictures and the six pictures on exactly the same day to see whether people were more likely to buy the four picture one or the six picture one. And then we'd, or we'd ask a question like, well, what happened if they changed their price? Or what happened if they changed um, their shipping fee? Or what happens if they run auctions and posted prices? So let me give you an example. So here's, a, here's an example. I'll give you a simple example, and then I'll give you a more complicated one. So the simple example is, is a behavioral economics example, and it has to do with, with shipping fees. So um, you know, I, I mentioned before that I thought the internet is a really nice place to test sort of behavioral economics hypotheses. So one obvious you know, one has to do with price salience. Which prices do people pay attention to when there are uh, uh, as Gabriel pointed out before, there's, there's, uh, there's prices that are included in the main price, and then there's prices that are not mentioned in the main price, but only mentioned uh, later on, like shipping fees. Okay, and so you could ask, for example, do people pay attention to, to shipping fees? And I think the natural conjecture might be, you know, maybe not because they're kind of hidden, they're not sort of uh, uh, front and center. But on the other hand, if you, if you do any shopping on the internet, and I'm sure everybody does, you know, one thing you notice is that people pay a lot of attention to free shipping on the internet. And that's one of Amazon's big selling points is free, free shipping. So you know, that sort of goes a little bit the opposite uh, direction. So that turns out to be an easy question to answer using the strategy I just showed you because we could go through the, you know, all of these different listings that people have made on, on eBay and we could pick out sellers who have uh, listed the same thing multiple times, either sequentially or simultaneously, but they've done it with different shipping fees. And then we could look to see whether uh, people are responsive to those extra fees. And we'll do that with auctions, because that way we'll get a nice sort of price effect. So we, if we do it with auctions, we can see that if a seller offers a, a low shipping fee and a high shipping fee, and you run the auction, if people really pay attention to the fees, the auction prices ought to go up to equate the total amount paid by the buyer, the auction price plus the shipping fee. So we'll look at the total revenue from the auction, price plus fee, and we'll see whether changing the shipping fee around is, has a neutral effect like you'd expect from sort of a textbook economics analysis, or you could manipulate your total revenue by changing your shipping fee like you might expect from, you know, from a sort of more behavioral uh, story. Okay, before I do that, let me just show you, just for a minute, what, how sellers actually set their shipping fees on, uh, uh, on eBay. So, so this is a, a table showing the distribution of shipping fees, where I've, the way I've broken it out is I, I, I've got it for all of the listings we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at 117,000 different auctions for 7,000 different items. And um, if you look at all the different uh, uh, items, what you see is that a lot of people are using free shipping, and a lot of people are setting pretty high shipping fees, and very few people are setting low shipping fees. And if you, you can see that more clearly even if you look at items that have different values. So if you look at the most expensive items, then you see people setting free shipping, or they're setting very high shipping fees, and even with cheap items, you see people setting free shipping or selling with pretty high shipping fees. And it's very unusual to just charge a small shipping fee. Can okay, you might ask, well, you know, that's just sort of a random empirical fact about the way people set their fees online. Is there any reason that they would, they would do that? And it turns out that, that there is. So here's an estimate of how people respond to shipping fees. And, and the way this is estimated is, for every one of those 7,000 items, we estimate the effect of a shipping fee, and then we average across, you know, each of those estimates is very imprecise because, you know, maybe the one, the one seller of those 7,000, you know, maybe he only had 20 or 30 or 50 listings, so we have a sample size of 20 or 30 or 50, so it's a small sample estimate of what's the effect of a shipping fee, but we take his estimate, and then we take the next guy's estimate, the next guy's estimate, we take 7,000 different estimates, we average all those estimates, and then we can have some statistical power to, um, to get a, 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 an average estimate of the effect of, uh, of shipping fees. Okay, so this is the average estimate, 
of what is the effect of a shipping fee. And here it's going to be in a picture, and the x-axis shows the shipping fee, and the y-axis shows the total revenue that the seller receives, the shipping fee plus the price in the auction that the seller was running. And uh, you know, if people paid complete attention to these fees, the, this line would be flat, but instead it's not you know, completely flat, and instead you, there's sort of two things going on. One is that, first of all, people like free. People really like uh, free shipping. In fact, they like free shipping so much that they're willing to pay $2.50 more for free shipping than they would if it was a penny shipping fee. They really like free. Uh, okay, so uh, people really like free, and, and as a result, you know, if you're a seller, you really don't like to set a low shipping fee, but once you're setting a shipping fee, people set, setting, that's a tongue twister, once you're setting a shipping fee, um, people don't completely internalize, they don't completely pay attention to it. So if you start with a very, very low shipping fee, and then you raise it by a dollar, your total revenue as a seller goes up by about 20 cents. So people somewhat pay attention to it. They pay attention to about 80 cents of the dollar, but they don't pay attention to the full dollar. And so, you know, setting a, a, a fee of, of $1 or $2 or $3, you know, maybe that's not such a great idea, but once you sort of get into bigger numbers for fees, actually it can be a pretty good selling strategy. So, you know, for a given seller, you might want to set a high shipping fee, you might want to set a low shipping fee, or sorry, a, a no shipping fee, but you wouldn't want to set a low one. And that was sort of exactly what we saw them, them doing. So that, you know, kind of makes sense that, you know, these guys probably all tried out different things and they figured out what, what works and what, what doesn't work. Okay, so that's a really simple example. So now let me give you a, a you know, as my last example, I'm gonna give you a slightly more complicated example, a little more, more involved example. And so this is an example that has a little bit more of a mix of sort of economic theory and, uh, and just sort of kind of, uh, empirical discovery, and so this has to do with um, different ways to sell. So one of the, one of the classic problems in, in microeconomic theory uh, is, uh, you know, what's the best mechanism for selling an item? Okay, and that's, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the problem that Roger Meyerson won the Nobel Prize for. So that's a, that's a famous problem, and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the usual answer is that, uh, you know, in, in our typical model is that an auction is a for a given single item, an auction is, is the best way, a well-designed auction is the best way, the best way to sell it. Okay. And, uh, uh, but of course, in, in, in most retail, we actually don't see that much uh, use of auctions. We mostly see posted, <coughs> posted prices. And posted prices, uh, as I'll come to in a minute, they also have, a, you know, have, have some nice, uh, nice advantages. And, and of course, there could also be other things that you might like to do, like, you know, like negotiate. And, and we know that in some cases, actually, that that negotiation can be a can be a can be a can be an optimal uh, selling strategy. Okay, so okay, so we have we have a, we have a you know we have a big body of economic theory about what's the optimal optimal selling mechanism. And when the when the internet came along and commerce started moving online, one of the the, the things that that people talked about right from the very very start was that the internet might change the the types of pricing mechanisms that we that we see. Uh, so this is, a, this is a quote from The Economist uh, back in February of 2000, and this was an article about internet commerce, and what they said was that, you know, what's, what they said was truly new about the internet is its ability to generate different pricing mechanisms, and in particular, various kinds of auctions and exchanges. And they went on to say that, you know, the internet might create a world where, where basically prices were never fixed. We never sort of saw much of in the way of posted prices. Instead, we would, we would have lots of haggling and, and dynamic uh, uh, pricing mechanisms. Okay, and, and actually that's, you know, that, the, I think some of that, of course, is completely right, but that turned out to be not the way that internet commerce uh, uh, worked out. Okay, so, so this is just to sort of see that. So actually when that article was written, that was in February of 2000, so you know, we're looking at this data from eBay, and actually in, back in 2000, eBay was the, already the dominant auction platform. They were an auction-only platform. They were actually the third most visited site on the entire internet. Uh, um, but even on eBay, auctions more or less have, have gone, gone away. So this is a, a picture just showing on, on eBay the, the uh, share of auctions relative to posted prices uh, over the last uh, decade. And you can see that, 
that auctions were 100, at one point they were 100 percent of the market, and even uh, at the beginning of this picture they were 95 percent of the market. But by the end of the picture, they're less than uh, well under 50 percent of revenue and well under 20 percent of the listing. So only 15 percent or so of the things that people list on on, on eBay. Uh, are, or that you would see on eBay if you went and, and looked uh, for items would be, would be auctions. Okay, and that's of course, you know, that's, that's true on eBay, which was a big auction platform, but it's also you know, quite clearly true if you just think about internet commerce in general. This is just a you know, nice picture from Google showing, uh, from Google Trends showing people's searches for online auctions and online prices, and you can see online auctions just falling off steadily for the entire uh, uh, decade. And of, you know, of course, the rise of Amazon and other types of, 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 of e-commerce uh, that, are, that are based on posted prices um, has also gone in the same direction. So we were curious as to why that happened. If that was one of the, actually, that was one of the first things we noticed when we started looking at their data. We thought that it was an auction platform, and then it turned out that we couldn't, you know, we could, we could find 250 million auctions or something, but we couldn't find a billion auctions. So we were puzzled, and we, uh, uh, so one of the first hypotheses we had, which is kind of an obvious one, is just that the internet had changed a huge amount in the last decade. So actually probably some of you, many of you may know the story of how eBay was started. It was started by a, 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 a guy named Pierre Omidyar. He, um, he was a computer programmer, is a computer programmer, and uh, uh, he set up an auction website in 1995, and to test it, he put a broken laser pointer up for sale. And uh, he was gonna throw it away, but he put it up for sale in the, uh, on, on his auction platform, and there was some bidding for it, and uh, the, someone bid $14.83 for his laser pointer. And he was, he was, I guess he was probably pretty stunned that someone had bid $14.83 for his laser pointer, so he wrote them an email and said, you realize that this laser pointer is broken, don't you? And the person wrote back and said, yeah. I'm a collector of broken laser pointers. <laughs> and I think at that point, Pierre Romero must have just thought, like, I have the best idea. This is going to work out really, really well for me. So, and of course, it did work out really well for him. So, um, okay, so you might have thought that, you know, in 1995, the things that people saw on the internet was computer programmers, and they were selling broken laser pointers to collectors of broken laser pointers. But, you know, if you look nowadays, it's, it's like people selling, you know, lounge furniture and, uh, Silverware and just any kind of department store retail good to you know to to uh, to my mom and uh, other uh, shoppers uh, like that and actually of course that's completely true I mean that is the internet commerce has become very professionalized and it's lots of big retailers and you could buy anything and and so forth but that turns out actually not to be the reason why auctions uh, uh, went away online and one way to see that is imagine doing the following exercise you 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 take um, you take every, uh, everything that's, uh, that's ever been sold on, on, on eBay and um, uh, year by year and you divide it, uh, you stratify things by who they were sold by. Was it a professional seller versus a, a, a small consumer seller? And you stratify it also by what was the type of product. And then you ask how much, so of course some categories of product are sold mostly by posted price, some are sold mostly by auction, you know, more idiosyncratic things are sold by auction, more commodity categories are sold by posted price. Professionals tend to use posted prices. Individual consumers tend to sell by auction. So you could imagine that changes in the composition of who is selling and what kinds of things are they selling would, all, would explain why people don't use auctions so much anymore. But if you, do this, if you do this categorization, you divide everything up by what it is and who's selling it, and you ask how much of the decline of auctions is a change in what's being sold, how much is a change in who's selling it, and how much is a shift in the way that a given type of person selling a given type of good has just decided to sell in a different way, it turns out that, 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 that basically all of it is, is, is a change in the type of selling mechanism within a category, within a typical type of seller group. And only a small fraction is uh, changes in the type of goods being sold across categories and, and, uh, uh, or within a given category the professionalization of that category. Okay, so then you could ask, well, why would, if you had a given person, a given type of person, selling a given type of item, why would they change the way they were selling something? So what, would, what, could, have, what could have possibly changed? And so that then we could go to economic theory to look for some ideas. And actually, economics theory has, some, has a really 
you know, I think in some sense a very clear prediction about when you would see people use auctions and when you would see people not use auctions. So you know, what are auctions good for? Auctions are good if you don't know what price to set. They're good for price discovery. So they're good for figuring out you know, what the market would, would pay for something and using competition between buyers to, to determine that, that, uh, that price. On the other hand, they're incredibly inconvenient. You've got to get the buyers sort of to pay attention at the same time. You need a bunch of buyers for a given item. And, um, uh, and if you're a bidder in an auction, you say on eBay, you've got to wait a week to get the good. So there's no immediate gratification. You can't just go, it's not very convenient. You can't just go buy something. Posted prices are great if you just want to make it really, really easy for, for buyers. Okay, and that trade-off between transaction costs and uncertainty or resolving uncertainty or price discovery, you know, that, if you just think about that trade-off, it, it tells you a lot about when you see auctions in the, you know, the non-internet world. You see auctions used to sell wine, to sell art, to sell hard-to-price things like real estate or oil leases or radio spectrum licenses or diamonds, and you see posted prices used to sell you know, items where People care about convenience. They want, it's not worth the transaction cost to, to, to run an auction. And the same thing is true online. You, if, you, if you look around on, on uh, if, you, if you look at what's current, even the, what's currently being sold on eBay, people are using auctions for things that are used. They're using things that are one of a kind, idiosyncratic. They're using posted prices for the standard retail uh, goods. And the more experienced sellers who might have more information, they're using posted prices. And the less experienced sellers who are selling things out of their garage, they're using auctions. So then we could ask, well, what, you know, could this, some might explain sort of in the cross section what kind of selling mechanisms is, but why would it change over time? And so, um, so that you, you could have, I think you could have at least two hypotheses. So one hypothesis would be that there's more information now. There's less need for price discovery because now you could just search on Google, you could find out what the price ought to be, and then you could set that price. And you can pretty much find the price for almost anything just by searching on Google. Or, you know, alternatively, it's kind of similar, there might just be more competition online. So there's, there's more people selling something, margins are going to get smaller, there's going to be sort of less room for an auction to work if people are basically, you know, they know the price is going to be close to their, their cost of, uh, of getting an item. Okay, so more competition, more price discovery, less need price discovery, those could, could push out auctions. And the other thing is that people might care more now about convenience. Okay, so, you know, in what sense? Well, you know, in, I said in 2000, eBay was the third most visited site on the internet. And you know, one reason it was probably the third most visited on the internet was there wasn't actually that much fun t on the internet in 2000. Bidding in, a, in an auction for a toaster oven was, you know, it was pretty fun, I guess. But now if you could go to YouTube and you could watch cat videos or you could, you know, go to Facebook and you could look at pictures of your friends, that's going to be more, it might be more fun. Uh, you might just get your shopping done first and then, and then go, uh, go by. So there might be more competition for people's attention that would, that would make uh, transactions costs uh, 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 of more, uh, uh, more pertinent. Okay, so, so that's something we can, we can study and we, we've, we tried to study. And, uh, and, and here's how, so let me just give you a sense of how we could try to study that. So one way we could look at this is we could say, let's take a given seller selling a given item and let's look at, at what kind of price they got uh, when they ran an auction compared to the price they were getting when they set a posted price. So this is for 2003. And in 2003, we're looking at sellers who sold the same item by posted price and by auction. And we're looking at the distribution of the auction prices relative to their posted price, at the, which they were selling. And what you can see is that, first of all, there's a lot of dispersion. So auctions, you know, the Prices sometimes are high, sometimes are low. Uh, but on average, they were just about the same as posted prices. They were very a little bit lower, but just about the same. Okay, and actually, sometimes the price in the auctions actually went above the posted price. You can see that actually, you know, non-trivial amount of time, people paid more at auction than they could have paid by buying something at a posted price. Okay, so now let me jump ahead to 2009. And in 2009, you can see this picture has really changed. In 2009, the, the, the returns to using auctions is, has fallen off. And in what sense? It's fallen off because uh, the distribution of auction prices it, there, um, is, is shifted to the left. Instead of being centered around one, it's centered around 
85%. So people are getting only about 85% of the revenue from running an auction that they were getting before from, from set it, that, you know, that, they're, that they're getting from their posted price uh, listings.